Stephanie Kelton is associate professor and chair of the Department of Economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. She is also editor-in-chief of the top-ranked blog, New Economics Perspectives, and a member of the Top Wonks Network of the nation's best thinkers. Her book, The State, the Market, and the Euro 2001, predicted the debt crisis in the Eurozone, and her subsequent work correctly predicted that one, quantitative easing would not lead to high inflation. Two, government deficits would not cause a spike in U.S. interest rates. Three, the S&P downgrade would not cause investors to flee treasuries. And four, the U.S. would not experience a European-style debt crisis. Professor Sheldon is a frequent comment commentator on national radio and television. She consults with policymakers investment banks, and portfolio managers across the globe. Please welcome Stephanie Kelton. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. So I have just 10 minutes to tackle a question of uh, pretty enormous magnitude. And I think as the introductory remarks, suggested there is really not an easy, quick way to answer a question like this. In fact, I think it's important to recognize that if you believe there is a quick, simple answer to the question, does more government help or hurt, you are probably not thinking very carefully. You're probably oversimplifying, shall we say, things. And so, uh, d but we do just have 10 minutes, so I have to simplify to some extent, and I have to figure out how exactly to attack this question, from which angle am I going to uh, focus my remarks, and because I am uh, not just an economist, but a macroeconomist, I'm going to tend to focus on the role of government in the economy, and where by government I primarily mean the federal government, and where by the economy I mainly mean the national economy, so I'm not as much talking about state and local government and their decisions and uh, the impacts on state and local governments, all right? So if your answer to this question, what is the best way for government to improve the economy, is a very short list of things. Maybe that includes something like the following. It's really just simple. It's one thing. Just limit the size of government, and everything else will take care of itself. Again, you're probably oversimplifying. Now, I'm going to use this as an example, and my position is going to be counter in many ways to the philosophy that uh, you see here, but I'm not accusing Congressman Ryan of holding such a simplistic view as the one that I just put up, right? That there's only one thing one needs to do. But I do think it serves as a, as a good example of a philosophy that tends to suggest that the role of government, the best way to improve the economy is, look, we believe that a renewed commitment to limited government will unshackle our economy and create millions of new jobs and opportunities for all people of every background to succeed and prosper. Under this approach, the spirit of initiative not political clout, determines who succeeds, okay? So that's the philosophy, and here's the way I see it playing out in practice, okay? When we translate the philosophy into actual economic policy, I think it generally looks something like the following. What you really need to do is unshackle the job creators, the makers in our economy, who are burdened by the oppressive taxes, and if you would just free them, liberate them, jobs and money, tax revenue will come raining down on the economy. Okay, this is the philosophy in practice, unshackle the spirit of initiative. So Lucy tells Charlie Brownback what to do, and she shows him the rationale and it's got good economics behind it. This is what Lucy says, right? Let me show you why this will work. So she produces the Laffer curve. Now, the Laffer curve is something that you can find in virtually any economics textbook. 
particularly a macroeconomics textbook, and it is named after its developer, uh, an economist by the name of Art Laffer, who went to dinner one evening, a little over three decades ago, in Washington, D.C., with a couple of journalists and a fellow economist, and on the back of a napkin, sketched out this curve. And what Laffer argued was that taxes are too high, and that if you reduce marginal tax rates, in particular on incomes at the very top, that what you will do is so incentivize the job creators that they will not be able to help themselves because the incentive is there for them now to go out and make something and produce something, hire some people, be an entrepreneur, it gets your spirit up, the tax cut will do it. So not only will you end up with more jobs and more output, Lerner said, you'll actually end up with more tax revenue. You cut marginal tax rates from this level or this level down to this level, and tax revenues actually increase. It's magnificent. You won't believe it. John Kenneth Galbraith was the chief economist for JFK, and Galbraith, sort of mocking this position, said, well, Laffer basically is telling us that the poor won't work because they have too much money, and the rich won't work because they have too little. <laughs> All right? So Art Laffer gets an invitation, because he's still around, and he consults with policymakers all over the country. And so Governor Brownback invites Art Laffer out to Kansas. Come out and help us. We want to create some jobs here in Kansas. We need some advice. Tell us what to do, Art. So Art shows up and collects his $70,000 consulting fee, paid for by the taxpayers in the state of Kansas, and Laffer tells the governor what to do. What does he say? You should cut taxes, because this will incentivize the job creators. So the governor says, let's do it. Let's put this to the test. It's sort of like the economics of the field of dreams. If you've seen the movie, it's the idea that if you build it, they will come. Okay? If you create the right atmosphere for the job creators, give them regulatory certainty, eliminate bureaucracy, government regulation, all that stuff they hate, get rid of that to the extent you can, and then cut taxes. If you can get them to zero, perfect business taxes down it and hack away at income taxes, you won't believe what will happen. Okay? So what happened? This is an effort by government to actually help, the idea that government can help. So we're seeing this play out across the state line. This article appeared yesterday in the Kansas City Business Journal. This is a quote from the Vice President for Government Affairs in Overland Park at their Chamber of Commerce. He's commenting on the effects of this policy on the Kansas side. He says, we've had conversations with people and they think it's nice, but we haven't seen any rush to hire new people or build new facilities. There's still the tendency to wait for the demand first. It's unusual to take the approach to build up the supply and expect the demand to come later, to follow. Wait a minute. If you build it, they will come. You're just supposed to create the incentives. What's going on? I think a better question is not, did it help? But for whom is it helping? OK, Kansas is lagging behind the, na the nation as a whole. Private sector job growth in Kansas is a full percentage point lower than the national average. We have fallen behind the state of Missouri, Oklahoma, and Colorado. The Kansas Legislative Research Department and Nonpartisan Department estimates that by 2018, Kansas will have lost, not gained, a la Laffer Curve, $4.5 billion in revenue. The bottom 20% of taxpayers in Kansas are paying now, on average, $166 more in income tax, while the 1% are paying, on average, nearly $20,000 less. So it does help. It certainly appears to be helping the governor's challenger, <laughs> who is leading 
in all but one of the polls that I have seen, and I'm watching pretty closely, he's leading in every, every demographic category, including with men and women. He's leading in all age groups. He's leading in all racial groups. The one category where the governor is doing better than his Democratic challenger is with those who have only a high school degree. The problem, I think, with this philosophy that all you need to do is deregulate and cut taxes and the job creators will do their thing is that it presupposes the most important part of capitalism, and that is demand. Capitalism runs on sales, and spending creates income. We have arrived at a point with the national dialogue where we are vilifying spending in the economy. We've made it the enemy. Capitalism runs on sales. One person's spending is another person's income. And income leads to sales. When our income goes up, consumption goes up. And that means you're buying things. And that means our businesses have customers. Sales lead to jobs. Businesses hire when they're swamped with demand, not when you dangle a tax cut carrot in front of them. Capitalism is a system that works well only when there are enough customers spending enough money to keep sales and profits growing. We've got a long experience with capitalism in this country. This graph goes all the way back to 1875. Those gray bars that you see there are either recessions or depressions. The thicker the bar, the more severe the downturn. You can see that in our past history, going back to 1875, we used to have depressions all the bloody time. Government was very small back then, only 5% of the total economy. We had no Federal Reserve for most of that period, and we had a gold standard. And we had absolutely huge swings in output and employment. The business cycle was off the charts. We were everywhere. Then we had Roosevelt and the New Deal and we institutionalized a bigger government that was there to provide a stabilizing force in the economy that kept incomes up in a downturn. So recessions replaced depressions. They came much less frequently and they were far less severe than they had been. Even the Great Recession, the thing we experienced most recently, pales in comparison to our long-term history. Hey, we were hemorrhaging jobs during the Great Recession. At one point, we were losing 800,000 jobs every month in the US. An absolute catastrophe. And this is how government helps. We institutionalized, after World War II, a system that buttresses those downturns. It works like a shock absorber in your car. So when you hit the bumps, you don't have to take on the massive wallop that you would otherwise take on because government deficits cushion the blow. When unemployment goes up, this is the unemployment rate, this is the government deficit. You can see how they move in almost perfect op opposing motion, right? So when the unemployment rate goes up, the government's deficit goes up. And when unemployment comes down, deficits come down. And it happens every single time. And the reason it's important is because when the economy experiences a recession, and it will, and it always will, when the economy goes into recession, people lose their jobs. You lose your job, you lose your income. With no income, you don't pay income taxes. So government tax revenues go off a cliff. At the same time, spending to support the unemployed, unemployment compensation, food stamps, Medicaid, and the like, those types of spending automatically increase. That's why they're called automatic stabilizers. It doesn't take a permission slip from Congress. We don't need these guys to work together to do what needs to be done to stop the free fall. We've institutionalized it so that the changes happen automatically and they keep the economy from spiraling from a recession into a full-blown depression. It's one important way that government helps. Here's how government hurts. When we watch the deficit increasing, and because the Great Recession was so severe, the deficit increased a lot. We had a deficit that increased to something like 10, 11% of our GDP. And policymakers start to panic. 
and they start to fight over the increasing deficit. And then they start to try to figure out how to fight against the increasing deficit. It's like being at the wheel of your car when your car goes into a skid, and your instinct is to turn the wheel in the opposite direction. But we all know that's exactly the opposite of what the manual tells you to do. When your car goes into a skid, you're supposed to turn the wheel into the skid. That's how you regain control. That's how you regain balance. We have the wrong impulse. We're trying to fight against the increasing deficit by reducing spending, by raising taxes, doing things that are designed to reduce the deficit, but which only make the economy weaker. So we've got two political parties. One of them runs around telling everybody that we have a spending problem, by which they mean we need to be spending less. The other party says, no, 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 you've got this all wrong. It's not a spending problem at all. It's a revenue problem, by which they mean we need to raise taxes. And don't you know both of these things take income out of the economy, which reduces spending, which kills sales, which kills jobs. So we've got two political parties doing harm. To keep the recovery going, and it does appear to be weakening, we've got to make sure there are enough customers to keep the demand high enough to keep sales and profits high. Once sales and profits falter, that's when businesses begin to cut production and lay off workers. We got to have the demand. Question is, where's it going to come from? It can only come from three places. It's us in the private sector, it's the government, or it's the rest of the world. It can't come from anywhere else. Those are all the sources of demand. So if we let the government just completely check out of the game, and the rest of the world is running trade surpluses against us, then we're left to try to hold the whole thing together. And the problem is the way that we have been holding the whole thing together for too many decades is by the private sector taking on more and more and more debt to keep buying the output, to keep the jobs, to keep the economy going. We never had a public debt problem. Everybody ran around saying public sector debt, public sector debt. What a crisis. We had and still have a private debt problem. This is what's wrong with the economy, or at least it's part of what's wrong. There's nothing wrong with borrowing to finance consumption if your income is keeping up so that you can service your growing debt, but that hasn't been happening in the US for a very, very long time. There was a time, the golden age of capitalism, the 40s and 50s and into the 60s, when workers shared in the prosperity. Productivity went up, output per worker was going up, and workers shared in those gains, and they enjoyed rising compensation. That hasn't been happening, and it hasn't happened for decades, starting in around the 1970s. Productivity continues to go up. We're very productive people, workers, but we no longer share in those gains. Look at the rate of growth of productivity compared to the rate of growth of compensation. Even in this so-called recovery, only those at the very top have been made better off. The vast majority of workers have seen their incomes go down, and they're still down compared to where they were before the start of the recession. Only the top 20%, and really only the top 10%, have seen their re incomes not only recover, but recover tremendously, right? These reports came out today. There were poverty reports that came out. We're celebrating, by the way, because fewer Americans are in poverty. The line went down. The problem is we've got 45 million Americans who are in poverty today. We don't have anywhere near enough jobs to satisfy everyone who is ready, willing, and able to work. Right now, we've got close to 25 million Americans who want full-time work and can't find it. Four million jobs, four million. Even if many of them are lazy, shiftless bums, the vast majority are not. And if they're doing everything they can to secure employment and participate in this economy, there are nowhere near enough jobs to enable them to do so. Workers are getting less and less as a share of total GDP. Going back to the 50s, we used to get workers as a whole used to get about half of the total economic pie. And now it's down closer to 40%.
the finance industry has grown into a behemoth. We talk about the size of government. This is the finance sector in this economy. It's massive compared to the size of government. This is from the Wall Street Journal. Our economy has changed in nature. We have become a financialized economy. Manufacturing on a declining trajectory. Fire sector, finance, insurance, real estate. They don't really make anything except they collect fees, right, and profits and so forth. Look at their trajectory, a doubling over this period of time. It's part of what's wrong, I would argue. So what do we do? This is the closing slide. What do we do? Just in closing, and maybe there will be time in the Q&A uh, to um, expand on these a little bit more. First, I have long been a, a supporter of a federally funded, locally administered jobs program, something modeled on the WPA, the Works Progress uh, Administration, the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the NYA, the National Youth Administration, which employed millions and millions of young people who, by the way, have unemployment rates double the rate of, uh, of you know, um, middle-aged people in this country. So a federally funded jobs program, infrastructure investment, our infrastructure is absolutely degraded, de dilapidated, um, and, and, an, and a national embarrassment. The American Society of Civil Engin Engineers every couple of years puts out a report card. The good news is that our grade is now a D plus, and I say that is good news because the last report card, our grade was a D. This is everything from uh, airports to our um, water treatment facilities, bridges, railways, hospitals. It is our national infrastructure. It is in severe disrepair. The estimate is that we need to spend approximately $3.6 trillion to get our infrastructure up to snuff. This is something we ought to be doing. The longer we wait, the worse it gets, the bigger the price tag gets. There was a time when this had broad bipartisan support. Republicans, Democrats, everyone agreed you do infrastructure. Now we don't even do that. Education, as a thought experiment, what did the Federal Reserve spend to bail out Wall Street after the crisis? A colleague of mine and some of the PhD students in our department did a study, and they came up with a number. And the number that they came up with, hang on to your hats, $29 trillion is the degree to which the Federal Reserve intervened, creating money out of thin air uh, to save Wall Street after the financial crisis. You could double Pell Grants and fund the system for 700 years at that level of spending. Okay, we have a student debt problem that I'm sure many in the room, especially the students, are well aware of. Um, there are ideas there, and of course, we needed to be doing much more to spend on research, innovation, technology. These are the sorts of things that lay the foundation for long-term prosperity in the economy. It's infrastructure, it's education, and it's technology and innovation. So those are my uh, opening remarks. Thanks very much.